Well, praise God. We're here to uh, go to His Word this morning, and uh, before we do so, why don't we just have a word of prayer and, uh, and just ask God to just open His Word up to us that we might just hear from it and be changed as a result. So let's pray together. Father, thank You that we can gather here together, Lord, as Valley Church. Lord, we, we know that we are not alone and that there's churches all over this valley that are gathering right at this moment, Lord, to hear your word and to be uh, changed by you. So, Lord, we just, uh, we just ask, God, that uh, your spirit would just open up your word to us. Lord, we might hear it accurately, that I might teach it the way that you intended it to be taught. And, God, that uh, we might leave here with a direction and a purpose as a result. Lord, uh, just uh, use us, Lord, in our community this week as, uh, Lord, we, we want to serve it on, on Saturday with, with the Christmas in the Ville. Lord, as we want to just bring our community together on Sunday for the night of thanks. God, as we want to reach out and support a local charity. God, um, Lord, we, we just pray, God, that you'd use those things for your glory and for your purposes. God, and you continue to grow our church, Lord, and call people to be saved pray that you do that even today, Lord, as we celebrate what you're continuing to do, the work that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you, if you got your Bibles, we're going back to the book of Acts, and uh, we've been in this series, Speak Jesus, and it's been a good one. Um, before we, we get into uh, our text this morning, which is chapter 10, that's where we're going, I want to get to know you a little bit better with, with a question. How many of you are sports fans? How many of you are fans of sports? Yes. All right. I got my hands raised as well. Okay. There's a few of you that are like, you know, I, I take it early, but you can put your hands down. That's okay. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what sport it is. Okay. But here's the deal. I grew up and uh, we didn't have cable as a family, but when we went over to some people's homes that did have cable... The channel that we would put it on was ESPN, right? And uh, we always looked forward to the weekend when they would have the show called Sports Center. And I don't know if they still do this right now because I still don't have cable, but uh, they have Sports Center. I know that, okay? But I don't know, and you can tell me, do they still do the ultimate highlight right at the end of the week? Do they do the ultimate highlight? You remember that? where they count down the top 10 plays of the week from all sports, okay? And they put it into a two-minute montage. Do they still do that? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, so basically, if you've never seen this, basically two minutes is all hyped up. You're seeing these awesome catches, these amazing dives, these incredible like plays, and you're just like, boom, your mind is blown, and you're pumped up. You're ready to go out there and, and play some ball. You're all motivated, right? And, and you see this week to week and you're like, man, I can be that too. I want to be an athlete. That was awesome, right? You know, I want to tell you this, as we get into the book of Acts, that the book of Acts is kind of like the ultimate highlight for the church. You're like, wow, yeah, that's kind of cool. But yeah, that's, that's really what it is. The book of Acts is, is a collection of all the, the big plays that the church had um, in, its, in its early stages. And uh, it, it's, it's inspirational, it's motivational, it, 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 it really shows us, man, this is what the church can also be today because we have the same gospel and we have the same spirit and we have the same power that they had back then. We believe that as Valley Church, okay? Now, I know some of you guys didn't raise your hands, and so I want to help you guys out as well. The church is also, and the book, book of Acts is also kind of like a scrapbook. Okay, we're going a little bit direct, a little bit of a different direction. Not quite as exciting. Um, you'll see that I, I brought some of my scrapbook along. There's me at seven months old, cute little Jonathan and little little Timothy in the same bathtub. Um, there's my parents. I'm I'm the little baby. And that's my older brother. Basically, what a scrapbook does is that it, it shows you progress. You know, what, uh, what has happened? Isn't that a little Jesse there? That kind of cool. Here's my birthday, Nike birthday. That's when Nike was cool, right? <laughs> I guess it still is, right? Um, basically, it shows you progress. You know, it shows all these main events that happen in your life and, and how, you, how you grow, how you change. Some, some of the important events like, like here, like, like our wedding day, getting married. Um, even this, look at this, check this out. 
Okay, pause it on that. Keep it on that for a second. This is a funny story. When Precious and I came to the church in 2009, it was right after graduation. We just got married. She's pregnant with, uh, with Zoe. And uh, we actually lived in the D&D motel right across the street from the church, okay? And uh, we actually lived there in this, I think it was probably a 12 by 12 room. It's just a bed and like a tiny bathroom if you've ever been in it, okay? Don't recommend it. <laughs> Not recommended. <laughs> All right, but uh, basically, uh, we lived there until we bought our house here in Payton City, and, uh, you know, it takes forever to buy a house. And so I actually, the deal I made with myself was I was like, I'm not going to cut my hair until we close on our house. And uh, that's how long it got. That was actually, you know, right around the time that we moved in. And that's how long my hair got. And uh, look at me today, you know. <laughs> I don't know what's happened, but maybe I should try that again. I don't know. Yes, yes. Anyway. We've made some progress, haven't we? <laughs> but basically, as, as, we, uh, as we look at, at, at scrapbooks, and this is a picture of our youth group, little Logan, little Hannah, uh, <laughs> little Kristen, and uh, there's, there's uh, Cameron back there, uh, and some of the other youth that... Oh, yeah, uh, Nathan's there too, yeah, and Precious, um, some, of the, some of the early days. But uh, basically, it shows how we've all grown up, hasn't it? And uh, how we've changed. And uh, as we look in the book of Acts, we, we also see that happening. We see what the church has done. We've seen uh, where it has gone. We've seen some of the key events in, in the life of the church. We see how it has changed. We saw it, how it began to grow and develop. And we've seen the good. We've seen the bad. We've seen the ugly. And just like scrapbooks too, we see the awkward, right? And we've seen some of those things in this book so far. And as we get to, to chapter 10 of this book, we see that just as the church continued to move, um, that the gospel continues to move with it and change things, change everything. And the reason I, I, I made this my title for today is that uh, I want us to know today as we read chapter 10 of the book of Acts, that we may see this as, oh, that was an event for back then, that's what happened back there but it is still a relevant event for today because as we said, the same power and the same gospel and the same spirit are present here at Valley Church and at the, in the churches in our valley and our churches around the world. God's church still is growing and moving and changing and uh, the gospel does change things. And so as we, as we get to chapter 10, um, the title of this message is The Gospel Changes Everything. Uh, I encourage you to open up there with me. And we're going to see how the gospel changes everything. This is a key event in the life of the church. And it begins in chapter 10, verse 1. So read that with me. And uh, I'll just we'll be staying here as our main text this morning. And um, bringing some application into the life of our church because of, because of our text today. So start at verse 1. It says this, At Caesarea, there's a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian court. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Chapter 10, we are introduced to this man named Cornelius. He lives in, in the city of Caesarea. Uh, the little bit that we know about him is that he is a Roman centurion. Um, he is probably, probably well-to-do. He, he is also a, 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 command, he's a commander in the Roman army. And uh, there are some things that are said positively about this man is that he is generous and he is devoted to prayer. Two really good qualities. And it says, says that uh, in, in uh, the, the following verses that basically an angel comes to Cornelius. And here is, here is what happens. It says, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have, been, have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one, Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, who, whose house is by the sea. 
When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a, and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, what we see from, from Cornelius is he has this supernatural experience. An, an angel of the Lord appears to him, and this angel has a command. He says, I, I want you to go send your servants to go find a man named Simon Peter, who is living in the city of Joppa. And this is the same city that a man called Jonah um, was actually uh, residing in as well, but, but this is a totally different time period. It's the same city referred to there in, in the Old Testament. And, and I, I really, uh, really love it because here Cornelius acts just like a soldier. What he does is he's received a command, and so he gives a command to his servants, and this, this one soldier says, go, go find this, go find this man, Simon Peter, in the city of Joppa. And, and what they do is they leave, and they're on their journey. And the next verse says that while they're on their way, we change scenes. Something happens. Something happens. Verse 9, keep on reading. It says, as they approached, the next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And so you'll notice we've changed scenes. We've moved over to Joppa. We've seen Peter. He's on the housetop of where he's residing, and he goes up there to pray. And it says there in verse 10, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. How many of you, when you come to church, all you can think about is lunch? <laughs> yes! All right, we have two people that are honest here. <laughs> In Valley Church, all right. But here's something you might relate to. It says that uh, not only was he hungry, it says, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. Now, the idea that we're, we're getting in our, in our mind is, woo, 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 circles in his eyes, and he's like all, you know, zoned out, right? And I, I don't know exactly if that's what, you know, is, is the accurate meaning of Scripture right here. Maybe, maybe it was just a polite way of saying that, Peter fell asleep while he was praying, okay? How many of you, um, maybe on that side, have great intentions of going somewhere and, you know, kneeling down and, and praying, and then, you know, you start your prayer and it's, you know, you just fall asleep. How many of you are like that? Yes, okay, we have a few more honest people here with that. I'm like that too. But man, I, I love Peter because he, he's just this normal dude. He, he, he's getting hungry. He's falling asleep, okay? And it, it says that, that God had something to show Peter here in this vision. Verse 11, keep on reading. It says that he saw angels, saw the heavens opened, and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, we don't totally understand what's going on because we're not back in that culture. And something that we need to do is, is understand the Jewish culture during that time to really understand Scripture See, see, for Peter, when, when he said that, that these were all kinds of unclean animals being let down from the sheet, um, basically in their culture, God had given them, given them some commands about cleanliness and said that there are certain animals uh, that you are not to partake of. You, you, if you read through, through the Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, you'll see in their law, there, there were some laws about the cleanliness of, of you know, how you eat. And there are certain animals that were listed as unclean. And so the sheet is descending with all these unclean animals, and, and, and the Lord is saying to Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, no. <laughs> Why would I do that? I'm a good Jew. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to disobey the Lord. I mean, he, he told me to, you know, follow these commands to, to not make myself unclean by touching these kind of animals, by eating these animals. So no, I'm not going to do it. How does God respond? Verse 15. It says, the voice came to him again a second time. 
What God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once into heaven. You'll notice Peter is being told by God, do not call these things unclean, which, which I have made clean. Don't call them unclean anymore, because I have, I have made them clean. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that, that Jesus is the one who can, who can change your identity. The gospel redefines our identity. And that's, that's, what, that's what Jesus did. And, and I, I believe that there's an example here, first of all, before we go to ourselves in the life of Peter. Uh, because th- there's something that, that I believe that we can see in the text that says that this happened three times. There, you, you notice that. It's, it's a little detail, but, but I think it means a lot. In verse 16, you'll notice it. It's, it happened three times, it says. Three times it happened. And, and, and there was two other events in the life of Peter that I can remember just off, of my, off the top of my head that happened three times for him. Do you remember that? Peter was a disciple of Jesus. And, and he was kind of a bold and courageous guy, but also liked to stick his foot in his mouth, right? You, you remember him? And the night when Jesus was betrayed, it says that uh, Jesus actually, as they were gathering with his disciples, he told Peter, he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny me three times before the cock crows, before the rooster crows, before the morning, the sun comes up. And Peter's like, no, Lord, that, that's, that's not going to be me. I'm not going to deny you. Well, wouldn't you know, um, Jesus is arrested um, and, and as they're, they're taking him and putting him on trial and, and beating him and whipping him and, and all, all throughout that night, the disciples then scattered along with, along with Peter, who kind of stayed at a distance, but he was noticed. And, and there was one in particular instance where he was noticed by a little, a little girl. Remember that? He's in the temple, temple courts where, where this trial is taking place, and this little girl asked Peter, Hey, I, I notice you. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? And Peter, to which he responds, no, I don't even know the man. And, and they keep on persisting. Well, yeah, we, we saw you with him. And he starts swearing that he doesn't even know Jesus. I've never even met this man before. That's, that's the way he responds. And all of a sudden, he hears that cock crow signifying that what Jesus had told, said about him took place. He was a coward. He, 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 you know, went away in shame, and it became part of his identity, I believe, because he, he became known to himself he, as the one who denied and left Jesus. And, and I'm sure there was incredible shame that he felt in that moment, in those days following. But the story didn't stop there, because as we know, Jesus was crucified for our sin. He, he died, he was buried, and three days later, he rose again from the dead. But that's not the three I'm talking about, because what happens is that a few days after Jesus rose from the dead, it says that the disciples were all together, and Peter says, let's go fishing. Let's go back out on the water. Let's take our fishing boats out, and let's see what we can catch. Well, they go fishing all night long, it says, and they are skunked. They catch nothing. And you know, what's, you know what's worse than catching nothing? Some of you fishermen will understand this. When someone pulls up alongside you and is like, hey, how many did you catch? That's worse than catching nothing. Because you're like, oh, man. What happens is there's a man on the shore. He's walking along and, and all of a sudden he, he's calling out to, to them on the boat. Hey, guys, how'd you do last night? Did you catch anything? And they're like, oh. Seriously, someone asking? No, we got nothing. All night, nothing. He's like, hey, cast your net on the other side of the boat. I'm like, what does he know about fishing? <laughs> what in the world? He doesn't even look like a fisherman. Random dude. Well, they're like, oh, what could we lose? You know, and so, so they, they pull up their net. You know, they put it on the other side of the boat. And all of a sudden, what happens? It starts filling up with fish, doesn't it? And it's, the net is so overflowing with fish that, it, that it's going to start breaking. They call the other boat to come on over. And they start hauling this big catch of fish in. And it, the boats are actually so full that I, I think the scripture says they start to almost sink. And Peter, actually, at this moment, as they're, they're handling all these fish, he looks back at the shore and he's like, 
That's Jesus. What in the world? And so he, it says he strips his outer garment off. He jumps in the water. He swims to shore. And there Jesus is with a campfire and breakfast already cooking on the fire. Okay? I'm like, what? How'd you do that? Well, they all sit down together. They have breakfast together. And then Jesus pulls Simon Peter to the side because he knows that he needs to talk to him. And the question that Jesus had for Simon Peter was this, Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter's response is, yes, Lord, do you know that I love you? He says, well, feed my lambs, feed my lambs. Jesus asks again, Simon Peter, do you love me? This is the second time. And Peter's like, yes, Lord, you, you, know, that I, you know that I love you. He's like, tend my sheep. Tend my sheep, Jesus says. Third time, Jesus asks Simon Peter, Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And maybe he's looking at the fish or, you know, things around him. Do you love me, Peter? And Simon Peter says, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. You know it. To which Jesus responds, feed my sheep. Three times, Jesus asks the question, I believe to combat Peter's self-identity as one who was a coward, one who had denied Jesus, one who had left him. I believe he, he, he asked him those three questions to reverse those three times that, Jesus, that, that Peter denied Jesus. And now his identity has been changed. It's been changed from one who was a coward to one who was a, a bold follower of Jesus. And that is who we know Peter as today. His identity had been changed. The gospel redefines, redefines his identity. Now, as, as you look at this first point, if you want to take notes, you can. Um, you can fill, fill in the blank there. But, but as we talk about this together, the age-old question has been throughout the centuries, is man inherently good or is man inherently evil? And if, if you think about that, um, there, there's philosophers that, that have debated about that over and over again throughout history. Something that the Bible actually makes very clear is that at our core, we are people who are inherently sinful. That's who we are. The psalmist said, and I have it on the screen here, um, in Psalm chapter 51, verse 5, it says, Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceive me. That's you and that's me, but, but it's also true, it says, of cute little babies and little children. And you're like, what? How can that be true? I thought babies and, and children are, are innocent until a certain, certain point in life. No, they're not, okay? The Bible says it right here, and you're like, how, how are you even saying that, Jonathan? I have experience with kids, okay? <laughs> can I just tell you that? Not only does the Bible say this, that children are sinful, but I'm telling you right now, having four kids, babies and children are, are inherently evil, okay? <laughs> they are. If you have children or if you've had children, okay, you know that. Don't deny it, okay? I'll tell you, this morning, I was down in the basement trying to prepare for church, trying to get my heart in the right place, and, and it sounds like World War III happening upstairs. It does. And I hear, I hear Precious saying, hey, guys, calm down. Stop fighting. Stop, stop. And, you know, they're complaining about, you know, oh, Jesse kicked me. Oh, you know. <laughs> I won't go into it any further, but basically they were fighting, okay? <laughs> and our kids are not angels. If you didn't know that already, just come to our home for a little bit. You'll see, okay? Just like their mom and dad, they're sinful. And, uh, man, all, all I can say is scripture is right, it is accurate, it is true. We are inherently sinful, sinful from the time of birth. We, um, we have an identity that is, that is sinful. It says in, in scripture in Romans chapter uh, 3 verse 23 that for all have sinned. It says there, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All includes all, every one of us. Um, our identity is that of addicts. Our identity is that of murderers and thieves and perverts. Um, we're, we are pretenders. We're prideful. We're, we're selfish. We're, we're addicted to, to lust. We, we're abusive. These are things that are in our heart, right? 
If we really think down to what's going on inside, we can see that we are spiritually dead and depraved and lost. That is who we are. In Scripture, what it says in Romans 6.23 is that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That is eternal separation and destruction and torment separated from God. The wages of sin is death, it says in Romans 6.23, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gospel. Now notice how God changes our identity. As it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, he took the just wrath of God on our behalf. He became sin for us by dying on the cross. That's what he did. He was sent to redefine our identity. And just as, just as Peter had that, that identity of, of sinful, of unclean, of, of you know, deceitful and, and uh, a coward, Jesus came for us while we were still sinners. That's what Jesus did. And that's the power of the gospel. Another scripture I want to point you to is this. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. It says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's you and that's me. Okay? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you, you may read through that and you're like, oh, we talked about that in church? And you're like, oh, that's horrible. Those are horrible kind of people. But if you think about it deep enough, I guarantee you as you read that list, you'll go through it and you'll start checking things off. Guilty, 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 guilty. Maybe there's something that you haven't done, but man... In the majority of those cases, those things are right down deep in our heart, aren't they? Yeah. Read through the Gospels in, in Matthew chapter 5, you'll see, see that Jesus says, if these things are in your heart, you've committed them. Mm-hmm. We're all guilty before God. And that's why Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to say this. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. I love what he says there. He says, but such were some of you. It's past tense. This is in the past. This is who you were. This is not your identity anymore. You were washed. You were cleansed of your sin by the blood of Christ. You were sanctified. That means to be set apart, to be used for a good purpose. Um, It also says that you were justified. That's a legal term. It means to be declared innocent. So yes, your identity is as a sinner. But as Jesus has come, your identity can be no longer a sinner, but as a son or as a daughter. The gospel changes our identity moves us from being unclean to clean. We have a new identity in the gospel. So just to come back to our text this morning, as, as, we've, as we've read it, as the sheet has descended from, from heaven with all these unclean animals, and, 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 and uh, Peter is being told, hey, take, kill and kill and eat. You know what this represents is it represents you and I in our uncleanliness before a holy God how we we have a new identity in Christ, that we can be partakers of the gospel as well. As we move on, we see that that Peter is going to need to understand this because he's going to be in the middle of a difficult situation. Um, As as we go on to our our second point in verse, verse 17, we see that not only does the gospel give you a new identity, but the gospel breaks down barriers. The gospel breaks down barriers. And that's the second point that, that if you're taking notes, you can write down. As we see the story continues on in verse 17. And it says um, that uh, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, 
Men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. So these, these servants had arrived, they, they're standing at the gate, they're asking for Simon Peter, and it says, while Simon Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. So God is in this, he's, he's telling them. Verse 20, he says, rise and go, and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your, for your coming? And they said, Well, Cornelius, a centurion, upright and God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by his holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So they invited him in to be his guests. Now, at first glance, as, as we've read through this text, this, this seems like a pretty normal interaction. Apart from the angels, apart from the vision, you know, there's servants coming into Joppa and Peter's welcoming them into their home. Okay, well, yeah, Peter, thank you for your hospitality, okay? And that's basically what, what we're seeing. That's what we see on the surface. Again, we have to understand this from a Jewish context because in that day, Peter and Cornelius would have been on the opposite sides of the social and the political spectrum. They would not have been friends. They would not have been able to associate with each other. It would have been looked down upon greatly by, by doing what they were doing. See, I, I don't know if you, you know this, but basically there was, a first of all, a social barrier. Cornelius was uh, part of the Roman Empire. He, he was a commander in their army, and uh, the Jews were being ruled over by Rome during that time. And so obviously, someone like Simon Peter, being a Jew, and the rest of the disciples and Christians, they would have hated the Romans because of high taxation, because of the oppression that, that they, they put upon them. They would have hated each other, okay? So there was a social barrier that was happening. Second, we, we know that there was also um, most likely an economic barrier because Cornelius, he, he lived in Caesarea. Caesarea was a, was a you know, a, basically a, a beachside town. It was, it was a place where people that had money lived. Rome had poured a lot of money into tourism there. They had built a lot of really nice buildings. Cor Cornelius, he would have had a pretty nice salary. He, he would have had a pretty nice home. He would have had vacation. Um, and uh, here we have Simon Peter, who is homeless, who's living with whoever would take him in, um, who does not have much of an education, um, who, is, who is probably looked down by on society. And uh, here we have these two kind of people coming together. There, there was an economic barrier that, that was coming in between them. But also, thirdly, um, I, I believe that there was also a racial barrier happening, as we alluded to before. You know, when, when, we, when we saw that uh, uh, sheet descend and these unclean animals, that, that represented those animals, obviously, that, that uh, were on the do not eat list for the Jews. But it also represented that uh, there are people that are on the do not associate with list. Those people specifically are anyone that is a non-Jew a Gentile. And uh, for Cornelius, he was a Gentile. For his servants and, and that soldier that went along with him, they were all Gentiles. And here, Cornelius was inviting them into his home. He was breaking a social barrier by doing that. He, he was, he was breaking, breaking that down. And it says that, uh, that they stayed the night, after they stayed the night, and in verse 23, that the next day, that they, they, he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. He's, he's taking the whole community there, his close friends, his relatives, saying, hey, come and meet this guy. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. And Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I too am a man. Good for, good for him. That was wrong for Cornelius to do. He just didn't know. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know 
how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any persons common or unclean. Okay, can I tell you why this whole passage makes the ultimate highlight real? Is that up until this point, Christianity had not spread outside of Jewish culture for the most part. And here by Peter coming into the home of a Gentile, he was breaking down social barriers for the gospel. See, Jesus had had made it clear he, he had come for all, for God so loved the whole world, the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That was everyone, whoever. Jesus made it pretty clear in his ministry how how he did that, okay? But for some reason, Jesus' disciples had operated in a way where they had kept the gospel centralized to basically Jerusalem and the Jews. And it wasn't until persecution happened that they started to spread into to other, other nations. That, and, and so as, as persecution happened, the, the seeds of the gospel spread, and it also spread it to non-Jews. And so, so we see as, as Peter, and this is why it makes the ultimate highlight real, as Peter shared the gospel with, with Cornelius and his whole household and broke that barrier, we see that it opens the door for, for barriers to fall in the rest of the book of Acts and for the gospel to go forth into all the world as Jesus had told them in Acts chapter 1. And it was totally in line with what I would say is the, the way that Jesus went about his own ministry, if, if you really think about that. Um, because, uh, you know, too often when we read the Bible, we, we think of it through this Western lens of, Oh, well, there was always, you know, equality and respect. And, you know, there, there was, you know, we, we, uh, we don't have, you know, the things back then. Well, back then, basically, what was going on was there were, there were major racial barriers, as I talked about, between the Jews and the Greeks, uh, between Jews and Gentiles. These people did not associate with each other. We can think of it today like the racial problems that we have going on. And what Jesus did is when he came to this world, he... He welcomed all. He, you'll see, he, he welcomed and, and spoke to people that were outcasts of society. He talked to the sick. He talked to people of different cultures. Uh, you, you'll see that, that even there, during that day, women were also viewed on, on just like the lowest tier of society. You'll see that if, if you read Plato or Aristotle, you'll see that in, in their philosophy, they, they didn't think much of women during that day at all. And Jesus, Jesus embraced them. He involved them. He, he valued them. Just like he valued people from all different cultures and races. And that, that today, we look at it and we're like, oh, that's a no-brainer. But can you see that that's what Jesus brought into the world? He changed society in that way, so extreme that that's what we have today. He brought value to people. He changed their identity. And, uh, and, and Christianity spread throughout the known world because of it. As we read on in this text, it, it says in, in verse 35, and we'll, we'll just skip over there. Let's skip down to, to that portion. It says, so Peter, um, he opened his mouth, it says. Actually, this is 34. He opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. God shows no partiality. But every, in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. I believe that's the key to this whole passage. Jesus makes us acceptable to God. Can I tell you, you may be here and you may be feeling unworthy, unclean. What Jesus did is he came to break down the barrier of sin for you by sacrificing himself on the cross. We see that not only did Jesus break down the barrier of sin, he broke down, as, as we talked about, the, the barriers of race and nationality. He broke down barriers between men and women. He broke down barriers of tradition. He broke down barriers of age. He broke down barriers of of social status because Jesus accepted the sinner. 
He accepted the abused. He accepted the dysfunctional. He accepted the outcast. That's who Jesus was. And here's the thing. If Jesus accepted us, we as Valley Church are called to accept one another. Scripture points us to that in Romans chapter 15, 7. It says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. You know that we glorify God when we welcome people who are different than us into our fellowship? That's, that's the beauty of the church. When we see, man, if Jesus can change me, he can change you. Who am I to withhold the gospel from you? Let's not say people's no for them just because they're different. That, that's the gospel, okay? And, and can I just say as your pastor, I am very proud of this church, Valley Church, for having a heart for the lost, having a heart for those that have been beat down, having a, having a heart to break down barriers of tradition, having a heart for breaking down barriers of men and women. That's, that's a big one, guys. Praise God. Okay, because, because we believe that everyone is part of this church. Everyone has been gifted, spiritually gifted, to use their gifts for the glory of God. You know, men, we don't have to dominate. That's part of the curse, Right? We don't have to dominate women. And, and the blessing is that, that Jesus showed no partiality. He didn't say one is better than the other. No, no we're, we're all equally valued. We're all one in Christ. And that, that, is, that is beautiful. I, I, I'm proud of Valley Church for also breaking down barriers of age. That this church is not just a church for young people. This church is not just a church for old people. It's not just a church for families. It's not just a church for singles or married people. This is a church for all. And so, so we, we continue to do that. I, I, I'm proud of Valley Church for also uh, breaking down barriers of, of dress. Can we just say? <laughs> Isn't that fun? Yeah, you don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to come to Valley Church a certain way. You can come how you are. Absolutely. Come, how, come, come as you are. And don't leave the same. Be changed by the gospel, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm proud of Valley Church in that way. way. Um, every week when we come together, we are an incredibly diverse and unique group of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, work experience, family experience, relationship experience. But man, our, our beauty is actually found in that diversity, in our unity, in our diversity. And that's, that's what God designed his church to be. Okay, so the gospel gives you a new identity. If you've trusted in Jesus, the gospel gives you a new identity. Number two, the gospel breaks down barriers. And then number three, and we're going to end with this. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read the rest of this passage. The gospel creates community. And we're going to see this as, as we end. You may, you may think as, as you're you know, sitting here in church, man, I, I really don't have much in common with other people. I don't relate well with, with many other people. Can I just tell you that's okay? Because you don't really have to relate with other people in, in your own experience. You just have to relate to them in relationship to the gospel. Yeah, yeah. That's what brings us together. Okay? So that's what Peter went on to preach to Cornelius. And we're going to end by hearing the gospel. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Verse 36. As for the word that he sent to Israel preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. In him we have peace. That's the gospel. Verse 37, You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. So he's giving them a little history lesson. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Verse 39, and we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us whom he had chosen by God. He's saying this from Simon Peter's perspective. As a witness, as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And this is a key one. 
To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of their sins through his name. What did Peter just do? He preached the good news of the gospel to these Gentiles. And it says that as he did, verse 44, while Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard them. It's like, it's like the day of Pentecost all over again. The Gentile Pentecost, we'll call it. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because of the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on even the, gen- on, on the Gentiles. Out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. What we see happen is that, that this Gentile Pentecost, you know, falls down. The Spirit comes. Many people put their faith in Jesus and their lives are changed by the gospel. And they go on to be baptized, signifying an outward expression of an inward confession that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. And we, Valley Church, actually have an opportunity to celebrate that today again. So praise God. Let's just give a hand. We're going to do it. We're going to do it again today, okay? We've got a man named Stephen. He's been part of our church. Uh, Stephen and uh, Linda, they, they've been a part of our fellowship all, all the way since uh, Valley Kids Camp this summer. And uh, Stephen wants to be obedient and follow Jesus in that. So praise God. We're going to do that at the end of the service. Praise God. And as they confess that Jesus is the Christ, they baptized them and they entered into a fellowship into a community of believers. Their lives were changed. And they, they, they found a new identity. These barriers that were set between them were broken down. And they found a community in God's church. And can I just say, um, we are finding that same thing here in Valley Church as we find a new identity in Christ. As barriers between one another are broken down because of the gospel, we then find community. Uh, a big effort that, that's happened in this last month has been our 242 groups. And that, that's been a huge way where people in our church have all been finding, a, finding true community through that experience. And if you're not a part of a 242 group, I encourage you to talk to me or, or indicate on a connection card you'd like to be a part of one because uh, that's God's heart for his church, that you join the community of faith here. As we end today, we want to just pray. And we want to thank God, but we also, we also want to ask, ask, ask you this question. As we talked about the ultimate highlight reel at the beginning, I want to just bring it back there because uh, we're not on the outside looking in. We're on the inside living this right now. God wants to do this again and again and again. And, and so my, my question for you is, do you want to bring heaven to earth? Just like we saw this happen here in the book of Acts. Do you want to see people that are far from Jesus, just as pictured in, in that sheet, come to, come, to, come to the Lord? God shows no partiality. Let's be active this week in our valley, in our witness of him. Be in prayer for those that are, that are far from him. And again, our prayer as Valley Church is every week we're praying, God, give us one more. God, give us one more. And so as we close in prayer, let's just be in prayer for a valley in that way. Father, thank you that you have drawn us together as Valley Church. Lord, you've got a really good purpose for us. And God, as, as we've seen this highlight from the book of Acts, God, we realize that, uh, Lord, we're going to witness a highlight even again today. Lord, we're part of that ultimate highlight reel. God, you're still active. You're still moving. Your spirit is still working in your church, breaking down barriers, giving us new identity, and giving us purpose and hope and community together as a church. And so, Lord, I, I just pray that, God, you'd continue to do it again and again and again and again. Lord, and that be, we would be faithful to the calling of Christ that you've placed upon us. As you guys keep on praying today, 
I just, uh, I just also realize with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, maybe, um, maybe there are also some of you who may not have that new identity. Um, maybe you're still feeling kind of like Simon Peter, unclean, unworthy, shameful, separated from God. Maybe you're feeling alone and without hope. And can I just tell you this? You can have that new identity. You can be changed. You can be transformed. That barrier between you and God, that barrier of sin can be removed. And it's all through trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. You can have hope. You can have eternity with God today by repenting of your sins and trusting in Jesus. Simply reach out to him in faith. As Peter said to Cornelius, that was one of the last verses we read. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. So if you're here today and you want to receive that new identity, if you're here today and you want to, you want to see that barrier of sin be broken down, if you're here today and you want to find hope, you want to find peace and community, why don't you just signify that? Just, just raise up your hand. I'd just like to lead you in a prayer just to help you as you follow Jesus today. Yeah, praise God. Praise God. Yeah, amen. Yeah, if you're here today, can I just pray with you? Lead you in a prayer right now? And this prayer is just meant, it's meant, uh, meant to be from your heart. It's like a, a letter from you to God. Pray, pray out loud and call upon the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, would you forgive my sin? Jesus, save me. Fill me with your spirit so that I can know you and serve you. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you, Jesus, for new life, for a new identity, for a new family, for a new purpose. Now my life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's praise God for those who have just been born into his family.